Welcome to Sacramento Central Seventh-day Adventist Church, and thank you for joining us for Central Study Hour, wherever you are and however you're tuning in. We're so glad you're here. We hope you had a great week walking and talking with Jesus. Amen. Our first hymn talks about that in the garden, the special time that we have to share with Jesus. And let's sing uh, the first and second verse of hymn 487. gets old. Hopefully we're sharing the joy so that other people can know it. Amen. Um, if you have a special request, please visit us at our website at sacscentral.org. Click on the contact this link and tell us where you're from. We love to hear from you. We love to hear your stories um, and your well wishes. They help us keep pressing on each Sabbath, each coming Sabbath. Our last song this morning is just the next page over, hymn 488. At first I prayed for light, and we will sing the first three verses of this hymn.
The fourth verse says, but now I pray for love, deep love to God and man, a living love that will not fail, however dark his plan. Are you praying for light and for strength and for faith and for love? A living love that will not fail, just as God's love does not fail us, however dark the plan. We know that God's plan is sure, right? So if we keep praying for the faith and the strength and the love that this song talks about, we will see him soon. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for um, the blessings of faith and strength and most of all love. We know that we love because you first love us and we are just so grateful for that gift that we can share it with others, that we can grow it on this journey until you come again. We pray, Lord, that you will continue to send your blessings on us now in our study. Be with Pastor Fred. Be with all of us as we continue in your word, learning about stewardship and how we can live daily, um, taking care of the, the things that you give us and remembering to return them to you. Be with us now. In your name we pray. Amen. Our lesson study this morning, morning will be brought to us by Pastor Fred Dana, our associate pastor at Sac Central Church. Our lesson today is from the quarterly on stewardship. It's lesson 11 called Debt, a Daily Decision. If you're interested in receiving a CD or DVD of this lesson, Call 916-457-6511 or email us at csh at saccentral.org. Ask for offer number C21811. C21811. And make sure you specify if you want a CD or a DVD and make sure you leave an address. All right, so let's open the quarterly to lesson 11. The title, Debt. A Daily Decision, that seemed kind of like a strange title to me in a way. Um, because what about people that are not in debt at all and haven't been in debt for years? Uh, it seems like they made a big decision about debt years ago rather than daily decisions today. Or is there more than one kind of debt? The memory verse tells us there is. Let's look at the memory verse. It says, give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another for whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. Romans 13, 7 and 8. So do we as Christians owe our love to people? According to this verse, we do. So we owe all the time, right? And we owe people honor. We owe people respect. But those are ongoing. But we don't have to always owe people money. Uh, let's go to the narrative. I, uh, the opening line is pretty interesting. Sometimes you can be lucky enough to find someone who is willing to lend you money. I never really thought of it that way before because... I guess I've been lucky enough. Um, Lori's father has helped Lori and I a few times, especially in our younger years when we didn't have much. A uh, couple times early in our lives, we got loans out on cars, and he paid the loan, and then we paid him back so we could knock off all the interest. And you know, sometimes you can knock off a couple thousand dollars that way. So it was very appreciated. And that, until I read this, I thought, doesn't everybody have a relative that will do that for them? He says, I guess not, especially when you all laugh like that. I realized I took my father-in-law for granted that he loved his daughter. I always thought he did it for her, you know. <laughs> but anyway, um, uh, I realized how fortunate I was uh, in that situation. But it says here, but in most cases, people don't lend you money out of the goodness of their hearts. They lend you money because they want to earn more of your money in return. And who does that? The banks do, right? That's how they make money. All right, so we should avoid 
debt, we should, or we should do everything we can to avoid debt. Uh, that seems to be the theme that runs through this lesson. But it does say that in certain circumstances, we may need to borrow money. All right? So how about a circumstance, well, your car breaks down and you have a job. You have to be able to get there, right? And if you don't have the money to buy the car outright, you secure uh, a loan so you can keep your job. Uh, sometimes you don't have a choice, right? Unless you've got a very generous relative or something. Uh, sometimes uh, you need to secure a loan because you're making an investment. And what are, what's the most common investment that's made by people between the ages of 18 and 23? Yeah, they, they take out student loans to go to college, right? And so they're borrowing money to go to college because it's an investment into a career that hopefully they'll be able to repay that loan later. So when a, when a loan is an investment, it, there's, a, there's some wisdom in that. Um, or buying a house could be viewed that way too, right? So there are situations where people feel like the best thing to do here is to get a loan, but I think we'd all agree you have to do it as wisely as possible with the intent of getting out of debt as soon as it's possible. Like for instance, if you don't get a house loan wisely and you go in over your head, what's likely going to happen? You'll end up losing the house anyway. Okay, so we have to be real careful about this stuff. And at the, down near the bottom of the Sabbath lesson, it says we must be careful. Spending money we don't have is the gateway for people to make covetousness and love of earthly treasures, the ruling traits of their character. As long as these traits rule, salvation and grace stand back. And that's quoted from early writings. I thought, wow. Okay, so let's go to um, Sunday's lesson. This one's called Borrowing and Spending. And so we're going to look a little more at borrowing first and then spending more down the page a little bit. But this lesson starts with a story of, you know, when the uh, students at the schools of the prophets needed to uh, build more housing space for all everybody who wanted to be there, they went out and chopped down some trees so they could build some, some houses. And um, one of the persons, uh, the ax head flew off the handle. They were right by the Jordan River, and it went out into the river, and of course it sunk. And what was the real big deal about that? The ax was borrowed. So how are you going to give the ax back when you lost the ax head in the river? And so uh, what, is it, what is borrowing anyway? Borrowing is, is approval or permission to use someone else's assets. When you borrow from their bank, you're using their financial assets. When you borrow a car from somebody, that's their asset and you're using it. All right, so it says this permission carries risk and responsibility. Does everybody agree with that? Anytime you borrow something, there's a risk, right? Just like the guy who lost the ax head, wow, how's he gonna, the risk was something would happen. He didn't think something like that would happen. But borrowed money is no different from a borrowed ax, except that borrowed money can have bigger consequences depending on the amount. Now, the second paragraph on Sunday's lesson is a really good one. I want you to follow that one with me. It says, the only reason we borrow money is to spend it. That seems kind of like logical, but you know, like, what? no, and that's, well, I think it is, right? It says, the financial risk we take is in presuming that we have the ability to repay and that there will be no financial surprises in the future. But we don't know the future, right? So there's always that risk. It says, yet the future is unknown to us, hence borrowing money always entails a risk. Does that make sense? I mean, we can have the greatest intentions in the world, but circumstances could change, and then there's a problem. All right, so it's what do the following texts have to say about debt? I want to look up all three of these, and I hope you'll look them up with me. Let's go to Proverbs, uh, Psalms, I mean, Psalms 37, 21. Psalm 37, 21. 
these are interesting verses. And at first, it was not the easiest thing in the world to know exactly what I was supposed to get out of it. But as I thought about each one, then it became clear. Uh, Psalm 37, 21 says, The wicked borroweth and payeth not again, but the righteous showeth mercy and giveth. All right, so this is an interesting one. What does this say about debt? Those who don't repay what they borrow are called what here? Wicked. And the righteous are merciful and give. Now, it says the righteous, righteous are merciful and give. Does it say they give directly or alone? It looks direct to me. And one time I had somebody call me up. It was in a desperate situation. They wanted to borrow money. And I knew their situation. And I knew they probably wouldn't ask me again for five years, if ever. So they promised to pay back. And I told them, don't even worry about paying back. I just gave it to them. Because I think it's better to give directly than give loans when you're able to do it. And so it, he wasn't asking for you know, half my life savings or anything. So I just gave him what he, what he wanted to borrow. I just gave it to him. In fact, I doubled it. And it felt good to do it, uh, to be in a situation. And I knew his situation. And I really cared a lot about this person. And I really wanted to help. And I knew he was humiliated to ask me. And I just wanted him to know that I was glad to help. It feels good when you can help like that. It really does. And I'm not telling you because, I mean, it's not like I make a habit of doing that. This, that was unusual for me because I'm kind of tight. All right? I'm stingy, really, honestly. Um, and so when I, I, it was almost like breaking out of character. That's why I tell you about it because I'm, I'm not bragging. I, I actually, it's a situation where I said, wow, I, I actually, now I know how some people feel all the time that are really generous. Anyway, enough of that. Um, so this verse says that those who don't re, uh, repay what they borrow are wicked, but the righteous are merciful and give. Let's go to Ecclesiastes 5.5. 5. Ecclesiastes 5.5. 5. My fingers are so cold that I'm having trouble turning the pages of my Bible. Anyone else having that problem today? Yeah, I heard the heat didn't get turned on until they got here this morning, so we may never get there unless the sun helps us out. Uh, all right, Ecclesiastes 5.5 5 says, Better is it that thou shouldest not vow than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. Wow, that's an interesting one. So don't promise or vow what you can't keep on, Right? And, and if you do vow or promise, keep it. And, you know, don't vow or promise what you can't. And so when, when we had to make a decision about Operation Joash, my wife and I had to talk for a while about what we thought we could do because we wanted to make sure we'd be able to do it for the whole year, like the commitment was. And so we had to figure out what was reasonable so that we could stick to it, right? Um, and when you take out a loan, it's like say you take out a loan to buy a house. You choose how many years you're going to repay, right? And that's going to determine the size of the payment. And so you want to make sure that you choose something you can stick to. Of course, with a, a, a loan, you can renegotiate it sometime in the future if you have a problem. But you want to do your best planning so you can stick to your plan, right? Because that's what honesty is all about. Uh, being true to your word. Okay, let's go to Deuteronomy 28. This one's, I think, fascinating. Deuteronomy 28 and verse 44. We'll read 44 first. It says, He shall lend to thee, and thou shalt not lend to him. He shall be the head, and thou shalt be the tail. So in this verse, the lender is what? The head. The borrower is the tail. The lender's the boss. The borrower is at, the, at their mercy. Now, that doesn't sound good, does it? By the way, anyone know what Deuteronomy 28 is? It's a chapter on the blessings and curses. This is part of the curses. Verse 45 says, Moreover, all these curses shall come upon thee. And so, in this passage, the lender being the head and the borrower being the tail, if you're the borrower, the borrower 
you're under the curse. And God was telling Israel if they were unfaithful, they would end up having to borrow from other nations and be at the mercy of other nations. And that did come true in their history. Now, Solomon um, put it another way. Instead of saying the borrower is the tail, in Proverbs 22, 7, he said that the borrower is the slave of the lender or the servant, depending on your translation. So I'm going to use an example of credit cards to illustrate this. Um, see, credit cards is a way of borrowing money, right? And so the terms of borrowing are highly unfavorable and stacked against the borrower. Have you noticed that? Like the interest rates are usually exorbitant. They're excessively high. And the late fees, they whack the tail out of you, the daylights out of you, right? And other penalties that you never heard of can come up. How many of you who don't raise your hand have ever felt the sting of late fees and the interest rates on a credit card? You realize, man, it really hit. I, I have felt the sting, and I'll get to that in a few minutes. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's no joke. Um, when you are at the mercy of the lender, which you are with a credit card. Um, so I want to throw out this question for you. Because credit card enables you to get what you want now, even if you can't afford it, right? That's the beauty of the credit card, isn't it? Um, why is having what one wants now not worth the anxiety over repayment? Is it worth it? The gratification for one day and then the anxiety repayment for the next several months? See, the anxiety repayment isn't worth it. You've got you to think those things through, right, when you make those decisions. So do we kind of get a picture of what Solomon means by his warning that the borrower is a slave to the lender? In the lower part of Sunday's lesson, uh, it says spending borrowed money allows many of us to live in ways that we can't afford. That's another danger of the credit card besides the high penalties and interest rates is that it's kind of a trap to live above your means, right? Temptation to borrow and spend is the heartbeat of a consumer culture that affects the rich and the poor. And borrowing, as Deuteronomy 28 says, then becomes a curse. You know, I, I tried real hard to get through college without taking out any student loans. Uh, and I almost did it. Uh, I got through my first three and a half years without a single loan. I had some good scholarships, and I worked part-time. And if I didn't have enough money, I took less credits that semester. And so I thought I was going to be in college for four and a half or five years because there were two semesters where I took a lighter load because I didn't think I could afford the full load. But when it got toward the, um, the middle of my, uh, last, my fourth year, I realized that if I did summer school, I could graduate and then go and get into the workforce. Only problem is to take summer school and that last semester I had to take an overload of classes which wouldn't give me any time to work. So I thought, okay, I can see the light at the end of the tunnel. I think I'll, I'll take out a loan. So I took out a loan for one semester only. And um, I was really happy about that. And then I married into debt. <laughs> my wife took student loans all the way through college and so when I had to decide if I was going to marry her I thought well yeah I got to take on her debts and so I looked at it as well you know Jacob thought it was nothing to toil seven years for Rachel and this is just that I don't even have to wait <laughs> well, it's not very long so I figured okay I can handle that you know it, they weren't that big in fact when we talk student debts, student loan debts back in that time, now they sound like nothing because they're so much bigger now. But I didn't think it was nothing. And uh, my paycheck, my first, my first paycheck as a teacher in the denomination was one-sixth of what I get paid now. One-sixth. So it's amazing how much things have changed. I'm not really that old, am I? <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. 
And it just kind of hit me. Maybe I am. You know? <laughs> All right. Question down at the bottom of the page. What spiritual dangers are there for a person who gets too caught up in debt? What are the spiritual dangers if you're really in debt? Do you think that uh, the temptation to skip out on tithing and offerings would be there if you're really in debt because you feel like you can't afford it? Yeah. Um, you, you can become more self-absorbed. And, um, you know, in the, the teacher's comments has some interesting stuff that helps answer that question. The question is, what are the spiritual dangers if a person gets too caught up in debt? Uh, do you think that debt is ever a factor in people getting divorced? Yeah, multiple divorces. Debt's a big part of it. Is debt ever a factor in when people commit suicide? Sometimes it is. Is debt ever a factor in something like depression? For sure. So Satan, Satan's forces know that spiritual wholeness is very difficult whenever financial obligations totally consume our lives and cause great anxiety. Now, a person can be in debt and still be totally faithful to God, okay? And, and God will help them through it. But it makes it a lot harder, doesn't it? Uh, you know, those who have avoided indebtedness generally enjoy better emotional health. And usually they get greater respect from other people, too. Uh, debt can seem like emotional quicksand. Have you ever experienced that? You know, it really feels like you're just sinking and there's nothing you can do. You just try harder and you go down deeper. I've experienced that. Um, when Lori and I were, this was my son was born and my daughter was on the way. And we had had some financial challenges and used the credit card with the good intentions of me being able to pay it off next time around. Other ex unexpected expenses, couldn't do it. The high interest. And, and then, you know, we, back then they had a pretty low cap on how much you could put on a credit card and we had hit the cap every month, interest, every month, late fee. And I felt like, man, we're never gonna get out of this. Um, I was on three quarters pay because I had neglected to go to summer school because I wanted to be home with my one-year-old son. And I was sick of school <laughs> and I didn't go. And then they, they said, you, because you didn't go, you can't be on full pay. They, let me tell you, teachers can really have their arms twisted. And so I was on three quarters pay and we kept, ha every month we had a car breakdown. You know, and it's like everything that could go wrong was going wrong. And so, I couldn't afford to put oil in the tank for the furnace. And this is, you know, Vermont, New York, much colder than what it feels like out there right now. And I was out cutting firewood in a blizzard to make sure there was enough wood to heat the house that week. And I knew what it felt like to struggle just to make through one week. And so, and I actually started trying to find buyers for my living room furniture because I, I got to get out of debt. It was driving me nuts. Well, it can be really tough. Indebtedness has, has become a common component of our modern life here, right? Um, families declare bankruptcy. Uh, cities declare bankruptcy. Even nations declare bankruptcy in our world. And, you know, we can think that because... Uh, you know, even nations can be in such debt. Well, why can't we as individuals? See, and multiple credit card payments can be a source of great anxiety. And this is, you know, uh, what I'm talking about here. Uh, so here's the thing. This is the beauty of it. God can deliver from anything, right? You know, God is accustomed to rescuing sinners from their sinful indebtedness and he's perfectly capable of delivering them from their financial indebtedness as well. I just want to tell you real quick that that debt I had got cleared in less than four months. Um, I made a move on, on a job and part of making that move resulted in some summer jobs on top of my regular pay it just fell into my lap. And during the summer, 
it was like I got double paid all summer long. And it was enough to clear up the crisis with the credit card, and it finished off my wife's student loans, too. And all of a sudden, I felt like a free man. I was delivered. I was just so thankful to the Lord. Because I didn't see how it was going to happen, and then everything just kind of fell in place. So the Lord had mercy on me. Now, if you get out in four months, it can't be that huge, but uh, still, it felt huge to me. All right, so let's see, where are we? We're still on, all right, we're going to Tuesday now, right? Okay, uh, stewardship and instant gratification. The author of the quarterly uses um, Esau as a contrast with Jesus here. Uh, Esau, as you know, uh, was a rugged outdoorsman. He was rather passionate man, controlled by emotions and feelings. And when he was really hungry and he thought he was starving to death, and I'm sure he were, probably was pretty hungry, probably felt weak, he traded his birthright. He probably didn't even really listen to what Jacob said. Jacob took advantage of, of uh, Esau's um, thinking with his heart instead of his head, or thinking with his feelings instead of his head. And so Jacob got him to trade his birthright for some food. Esau, all he cared about was the instant gratification, feel better. And then you have Jesus, who actually went without food for 40 days and really was starving to death. And in such a weakened condition, he did not yield to the desire to gratify his incredible craving. So Jesus lived his entire life denying the pleasures of sin and denying gratification. And of course, the author of the quarterly opposed Jesus as the example to follow, not Esau, right? And so right down here it says, the best this world can offer is to experience the here and now because it cannot offer an experience in the hereafter. To live for yourself is the opposite of living for God. And that was what Esau was doing when Jesus was living totally for God. And I guess you could say for us, right? So the question on Monday's page, what do the following texts teach about the potential dangers of instant gratification, even for faithful people? So I don't know how many of you looked up these verses, but the first one, 2 Samuel 11, 2 to 4, that's the story of David on the palace high up sees Bathsheba taking a bath and he lusted after her and had her brought to the palace he lay with her and so the question is what do the following text teach about the potential dangers of instant gratification even for faithful people David was one of God's people and yet his, he, he yielded to this desire for instant gratification in the area of human sexuality and didn't it start a terrible chain of consequences that went on for two decades? He lost four sons because of that mistake, because of the upheaval that it started in the family, and lay, lay, leading to people killing. So that was pretty, pretty serious. Uh, one, one day of instant gratification resulted in 10 years of bloodshed in his family. All right, Genesis 3, 6. Now, Genesis 3 is what, what's in Genesis 3? The whole thing with Adam and Eve at the tree, right? Or Eve at the tree. So Eve desired the forbidden fruit. She yielded to what she thought would be some great gratification in eating it. And didn't that begin a whole mess for the, and not just for two decades, but for six millenniums of disaster to planet earth one moment of yielding to instant gratification look at what it started all right let's go to philippians 319 let's look this one up philippians chapter 3 verse 19 this is a really interesting verse in this verse paul is talking about people who don't deny aren't willing to deny themselves to follow jesus and verse 19, he says, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. So what does this verse teach us about the potential dangers of instant gratification? When it says whose God is their belly, what area of instant gratification is being addressed here? Yeah, 
uh, gratifying appetite. And what does the verse say is the end for those people? Yeah. Whose end is destruction. That's pretty serious. All right. Let's go to 1 John 2.16. 1 John, just a little bit before Revelation there. Right after 2 Peter. 1 John 2.16 it says, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Okay, so the potential danger of instant gratification here is to gratify lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, or the pride of life. In other words, all the pulls of the world. And what is, what is the end result of that? If it's not of the Father and it's of the world, isn't that going to result in a loss of eternal life? Yeah. In Romans 8.8, 8, it's the same thing. In Romans 8.8, 8, it says, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So when you gratify the flesh, the danger is losing eternal life. And of course, you know, you understand, when I'm saying all this, you understand we're all sinners. We probably have all indulged the lust of the flesh in some way at some time in our life. And so we have to listen to the call of God to repent so that we can be right with God so it doesn't cause our destruction. So we can break away from those type of life patterns. All right. Um, bottom paragraph on Monday says the desire for instant gratification is symptomatic of an uncontrolled mind. Is that right? Yeah. And, and, and it undermines long-term goals. You know, when people make long-term goals, um, but yet they yield to the desire for instant gratification, they risk those goals. They won't reach them. Uh, it says to delay gratification is a learned principle. Do babies naturally know how to delay gratification? <laughs> Parents have to teach little children how to delay gratification, that it pays off if you do. And it's hard for little kids to get that. As they get older, they understand it better, but it's a lesson that has to be learned. It says it is a life skill that helps manage situations and pressures. And you know, and if, if you don't learn those things as a child about delaying gratification, then you're an easy victim to quick fixes, get rich quick schemes and stuff like that. Because you don't know how to resist. It says once we have experienced instant gratification, we are more likely to choose a short term re reward again and then again and again. So when children always get what they want, when will they learn how to be adults? They will be children in adult bodies. And a lot of people in our world are children in adult bodies because they don't know how to delay the desire for instant gratification. Right? And so it says we must not fall into that trap. Now in the, in the teacher's comments, there's a section, I gave it a, I gave it a title called uh, I want it now versus wait. And, you know, we live in an age of instant gratification, right? I mean, everything's instant, right? We have instant meals. We have microwave ovens. When I was a kid, there weren't microwave ovens. We had to wait for things to cook, <laughs> you know? And like, oh, man, we don't have time to wait now. You know, just pop it in a microwave. And when we have um, overnight loans or easy credit for a loan for a car, uh, fast food restaurants, instant communication. Now, I'm not knocking all this instant stuff. It's pretty awesome, actually. Um, think about instant communication. You know, in generations past, they waited anxiously, sometimes for months, to receive letters from around the world. And today's uh, communications, we got Skype, where not only can you get the message right away, you can see their face. I mean, can you imagine in Ellen White's day, anyone imagining something like that? In fact, when I was a kid, I couldn't imagine something like that. But I saw it all happen, just like all you did, right? Um, and so you know, we got other technological advances. You know, you can have a discussion on Facebook with somebody on the other side of the world, right? You might have to wait a few seconds, but it's only for typing, right? All right, so you know, these modern miracles are not necessarily bad in and of themselves. In fact, they can be very good. Um, but they can easily contribute to an atmosphere of instant gratification that fosters the attitude of, I want it now, and I'll find a way to get it now. And I remember this when I was in college. Um, 
my freshman year in college, some of my you know, classmates from my senior year in academy, I saw them go to college and they made different choices than me. Uh, maybe they felt they had to. I, I got to be a day student and so I could borrow a car. And I lived close enough to walk a lot. I only lived a mile from the college. So I didn't have a big struggle with uh, transportation, but there were some guys that I had graduated from academy with that they took out the maximum student loans and then they took out loans to get brand new Trans Ams and Firebirds and roar around campus and pick up girls, you know? And so uh, I remember thinking, how are they going to survive four years of college? This debt is just gonna grow incredibly with the way they're, they're carrying on. Most of those guys dropped out of college. The long range goals got lost sight of in the immediate gratification of you know, the image they wanted to have. Uh, there was financial pressure. Um, and, and there probably was evidence that their minds weren't really into college either. And so they dropped out. So we have a culture of uh, instant gratification and it's widespread, especially in the Western nations. And spiritually, this ravenous hunger that people have displays an absence of trust that God will take care of things in the long run. That's how you delay instant gratification. You put your trust in God that he knows what will make you happy and he'll take care of you. You know, you think about Ahab. He wanted Naboth's vineyard now. And Saul, he wanted Samuel to come now do those sacrifices. When Samuel didn't come, he did them himself, which was blasphemy. So where is the trust that God will supply the things needed when they're needed the most? See, it all comes down to that, right? Are we going to trust God or are we going to gratify ourselves and take care of what I want now? You know, it's a focus on what I want now, not on how God is guiding me in his service now and in the future. See, a service mentality can delay gratification. And that's why we, in order to be able to delay gratification, we have to have a higher mission. Does that make sense? Now, in the teacher's comments, there's this question, and this is actually a hard question to answer because it can only really be answered with specific situations. But the question goes like this. How can believers differentiate between things that can wait and things that are immediately essential? That's a good thing to think about, right? What's, what is immediately essential? Well, I guess you have to have food to eat. You know, you have to have a place to lay your head. Um, you have to get your books for school if you're a student. There's some things that are immediately essential and, and then other things that are not. All right, let's go to Tuesday. Tuesday, living within your means. This uh, narrative starts out by contrasting people who take economic responsibility compared to people who their way of handling money is better termed as wasteful management or mismanagement. It says, foolish people make no plans to live within their means. I don't understand that. It's like they don't think about it. Kind of a hand to mouth existence kind of thing. They greedily spend wealth at their disposal, even borrowed wealth, feeling that financial wisdom or frugal living is a hardship like an unwanted diet. I <laughs> thought it was interesting compared to an unwanted diet. <laughs> you know, disciplining myself, that's like, that's like not, you know, not being able to eat what I want to eat. <laughs> so there's um, this thing here about wealthy people. Wealthy people can more easily live within their means, but does that mean they don't worry? The, the, the author of the lesson says, well, they worry about their wealth and how to make sure they keep it. All right, so being wealthy doesn't mean you don't worry, does it? <laughs> um, and how about poor people living from paycheck to paycheck? Well, they might be more worried about sustaining life than about wealth. They just got to get by, right? So they're going to be worrying about that. So it's like, it's like everybody can worry about it, rich or poor, unless all your trust is in the Lord, right? Uh, in near the middle of the page, there's a, a verse from Paul 
It says, Paul recommends what we might consider extreme simplicity. And, you know, that word extreme, think about it. Is Paul being extreme here? This is what it says. But if we have food and clothing, we'll be content with that. And they put in housing, because Paul didn't even mention housing. All right, so if we have food and clothing and housing, we will be content with that. 1 Timothy 6, 8. So does Paul consider earthly possessions very important? Doesn't seem like it, because for him, living in Christ is enough. So, you know, this one challenges me, because is, is this too extreme? I like to be comfortable, don't you? You know? We like to be comfortable. But do you think maybe we're too comfortable in this world? Paul wasn't that worried about comfort. If he had food and clothing, he could carry on doing the gospel. This one challenges me. Does it challenge you? I know, I know that in the last days, when, it's, when we're at the very end, and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and all that, that we'll understand this and, and be content with it if we're still following God. But can't that wait? <laughs> Some things to think about there. All right. Question from the Corley. What principle must be remembered before anything else? How many of you know what Matthew 6.33 says? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So what must be remembered before anything else? A saving relationship with Jesus is the most important thing in this world. Right? But the next question is, how can we be sure that this is how we are living? Are you living as though you really believe a saving relationship with Jesus is the most important thing? How can you be sure you are? That's, that requires some self-examination, doesn't it? You know, but we know that that can only be by full and total surrender to God and listening to a biblically educated conscience. It's not just follow your heart. It's follow a biblically educated conscience, right? All right, so the, the rest of this um, page gets into um, the way we should look at our income as resources. And, um, you know, it actually it helps to view everything you have as belonging to God. That helps me. If I think about what I have as belonging to God, it helps me be more careful with it. But they're talking about the importance of budgeting. Uh, it says discipline, practice, and effort are needed to be a successful manager and a and managing a balanced financial plan, planning carefully. It says, if you're having problems with money management, set up a budget. And it says, it doesn't have to be complicated. It could be as simple as a list of what you're spending compared to a list of your income, just to make sure you're staying within your means, right? I mean, that, that's pretty important. Um, let's go to um, Wednesday's page. Saying no to debt. This is interesting. You... you um, I'm going, to throw out, I'm going to throw out Friday's question number three before we get into this because it really fits well on this page. Because Wednesday is saying no to debt. The question on Friday says debt's really not a problem because Jesus is coming soon. Jesus is coming soon. Go ahead and get in debt because you won't have to pay it. You know, the question is how would you respond to that, that assertion? See, we don't know for sure when Jesus is coming, and we don't know what other things can happen. It's never smart to have unnecessary debt. Let's read Deuteronomy 28, 12. This is a very interesting verse. Deuteronomy 28. Deuteronomy 28, 12. Let's see what this verse is going to teach us about um, too much debt. Okay. Deuteronomy 28, 12. The Lord shall open unto thee his good treasure, the heaven to give the rain into thy land in his season, and to bless all the work of thine hand, and thou shalt lend unto many nations, and thou shalt not borrow. So what does this teach us about getting into too much debt? Or what principle do you see at work here? By the way, this is Deuteronomy 28 again, but this time it's in the section on the blessings. 
Verse 12 is in the blessings part, so it's good here. So what do you see in this verse? You see God's blessings, right? He says he'll, he'll open up his treasure, the heavens will give their rain on your fields, and you'll lend to many nations and you will not borrow. So God's purpose is to bless us. And if we're good stewards with that blessing, we will be in the position of lender and not borrower. And that's what God wanted Israel as a nation. God wanted Israel to be the nation that would be the bank for the other nations. Have you, did you ever realize that? Israel was meant to be the lending nation that kept all the other nations going. If they had actually been the kind of people God wanted, he meant to bless them that much. You can understand why it was so galling for them to be under the Romans during the time of Jesus. They knew about these verses. The blessings that Israel could have had are phenomenal. They could have been the bank of the planet. All right, so the principle didn't come true for Israel. Maybe during the time of Solomon it did to some extent because they were quite you know, influential and wealthy during that time, but that would be about it. Um, does the principle apply to us? You know, the principle can apply, right? But now it has to be on more on an individual basis. Have you ever run into some, some good Christian that had means and used those means to be a blessing? Have you ever seen that? There's, that's what ASI is all about. There's people there that have a lot of money. They're Adventists. They're faithful people. And they bankroll a lot of mission projects. And a lot of those people help, help ministries like Amazing Facts. And those are people that, for some reason, I don't know why I didn't get to be one of them, okay? But those are people that God knew he could trust with those, with those resources because they would use them to bless. All right, so let's go on to the narrative. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to that thought. I, I think we are going to, yeah. Um, the narrative says it's just common sense to avoid debt as much as you can. Scripture discourages us from co-signing other people's debts as well. Did you know that? Did you know that? Let's look at those verses. Uh, I had somebody co-sign a loan for me one time, and um, I didn't realize the Bible actually told them not to do it. <laughs> um, let's see, that's um, Proverbs 17, 18. Let's go to it real quick. We really don't have time, but uh, you got to see it if you're not familiar with this. Uh, why am I having trouble finding it? I'm going the wrong way in my Bible. That's why I'm in trouble finding it. All right. Proverbs uh, 17, 18. All right. It says, A man void of understanding striketh hands and becometh surety in the presence of his friend. Becoming surety in the presence of his friend means you're, you're guaranteeing you'll back up your friend's whatever the financial venture is. But in chapter 22, 6, it actually says it more plainly not to even do that. Uh, Proverbs 22, 6 says, Be not thou one of them that are sureties for debt. Striking hands, I think, means they do it on a handshake. Today, we, you co-sign a loan. So in that day, you shake his hand and say, I'll back you up. Today, they sign, they co-sign a loan. Um, now, the person who co-signed for me they, I paid it, so there was no problem. But um, I didn't realize that was in the Bible at that time. All right, there's a quotation here from Councils and Stewardship 272. says, there must be a strict regard to economy or heavy debt will be incurred. Keep within bounds. Shun the incurring of debt as you would shun leprosy. I don't think you get much plainer than that, can you? You know, debt can be... Uh, financial bondage and it'd be a wrong attitude to think well just because the whole country's in debt and everybody understands that's just the way we live well that still isn't smart right it still would be bondage you realize the danger the united states is in because we're trillions of dollars in debt you realize a day of reckoning has to come somehow some way and it's going to be really bad when it does really bad 
this country will not survive the way it is when that day comes. I don't see how it's possible. And I'm not an economist, so maybe someone will sit there and say, oh, Fred, you don't understand, you know. It's not that big a deal. I think it is. It's my opinion. Somewhat educated opinion. Yeah, I just want to tell you about Robert Letourneau. Um, because remember I said that God wants, wants to bless people so they can be a blessing to others, and that's not just in you know, things you do. That's in finances as well. It says, God, this is teacher's comments, God bestows the intelligence with which to build wealth. He wants to multiply our financial resources. He finds trustworthy stewards such as Robert Letourneau and entrusts them with wealth. Listen to this. With his wealth, wealth, Letourneau founded a Christian college and by the end of his life was reportedly living on 10% and returning 90% to God. Wouldn't it be awesome to be able to do that? I mean, you can't imagine how good that would feel to know that you could, you're helping so much and that God has blessed you so you can do that. I don't know how many people would if they had that ability, but that is an awesome thought. And so um, we have opportunities before us, but can God trust us with those kind of resources? All I can figure is he hasn't turned me into a rich man, so he must figure I don't need it. Maybe I'd get, you know, maybe I'm you know, too stingy and he doesn't say, look, what would you do with it? You'd put it all in the bank, wouldn't you? And hang on to it. Make sure you have your big retirement thing. That's probably what I would do. And so God says, all right, so I'll find someone else who will share. So I said, Lord, teach me how to be more generous. Teach me to find joy and generosity. Uh, this is an awesome lesson. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, again, if you are interested in receiving a CD or a DVD of this lesson, call 916-457-6511 or email us at csh at saccentral.org and ask for offer number C21811. And make sure you leave an address. And again, thanks for joining us today. And may God bless you and guide you.